Uh, I really, really want you to work for your lunch. Okay, I want there to be kind of lots of interaction and discussion. So please think of really difficult questions. Uh, we love impossible questions because we just pass them on to each other. Um, so think of the questions, the issues as we're going along, and I encourage the speakers to challenge each other. Um, I think if we save all that to the end, and then we know how much time we've got to, um, to think about those, um, the three areas are, uh, I just want to just say you're thinking about how you might participate. First of all, when we finish the presentations, any particular comments or direct questions about the three presentations. Um, secondly, what about the challenges? So what are the challenges that, that you're facing or you think uh, the country's facing? This is particularly focused around the planning system. Lord Renfrew has so quite rightly pointed out um, things that are happening uh, in the agriculture bill, you know, death for the DEFRA world and other worlds are very important. But this session, I think, is mainly focused around the planning system. So what are the challenges um, about those? Uh, and I'm going to challenge you if you ask a question. It's like, what are we going to do about it? So we'll try and turn the challenges and the criticisms of what's wrong with the world about what we might do. And then thirdly, before we have lunch, just think a bit more positively about the opportunities, like the good things, things that we might want to happen in future. And even if some of them feel a bit aspirational and not going to happen in the short term, um, they're really good to have a kind of long list of things that we want to, um, to deal with. So, a um, tiny bit about me. So, I'm Policy Director at Historic England. Um, I often think I was born a planner. By nature, I'm a planner. I'm not an archaeologist, and there's lots of archaeologists in the room. Some of them have threatened me with impossible questions about archaeology. Uh, I won't be very good at them. Uh, but um, I'm a planner and a building conservation person by background. Uh, I worked in a number of local authorities doing kind of area conservation work, planning, casework, heritage stuff generally. Um, before I drifted into English Heritage in 1996. Did a number of roles there, some kind of proper on the ground roles, giving out grants, telling people what they could and couldn't do, um, negotiating on regeneration schemes, that kind of thing. And then around about 2002, drifted into the policy world and uh, wrote the first what's now called Heritage Counts, kind of annual audit of heritage. And anyway, since then I've become rather obsessed about a, the importance of policy and the kind of big picture stuff and how you migrate the wisdom and the information that, that comes from the ground, from the coalface, how you use that information, package it, and repackage it to persuade politicians, um, developers, people with influence about the importance of heritage and the direction it needs to go in. Um, and also the Heritage Council's perspective, I think, has reminded me of, over and over again about how important it is to have good data uh, and data that means something to people. And I was going to share one bit of information with you, which is my statistic of the month, if not the year, uh, which is that in the past, and I don't understand the reasons for this, but in the past five years, there have been 40,000 new houses, new dwellings, created from pre-1919 buildings. So you'd imagine that over time, you demolish old buildings and new buildings come along. But actually, the number of housing units in pre-1990, the, the date from pre-1919 pre has increased. So in a way, it kind of feels like that can't be true. I suspect it's to do with conversions about subdivisions. Um, and I think this is a really, you know, in my view, a positive thing about how old buildings and sites can be repurposed. But this thing about that number, I think, is an interesting one, and one that we can use to catch people's attention, to get them to think about heritage uh, and the place that it might play uh, in solving current challenges you know, about housing, uh, better quality places, high quality design, all that sort of thing. Anyway, that's my introductory ramble. Um, I'm now going to pass over to Victoria Banks-Price, who's going to uh, introduce herself and then um, talk you through um, her thoughts, uh, particularly from the Woodland Trust uh, perspective. Thank you very much. Thank you ever so much, Duncan. Um, I'm also not an archaeologist. Um, I am a planner. I've been with the Woodland Trust for seven years now. Um, previously, I worked in local government and for the private sector, and I also worked in a, a regional development agency that we used to have back in the day, the, the, good, the good old days, depends who you, who you talk to, really, um, of regional um, policy. Um, I was just saying to Duncan that I am not an archaeologist, but I always rent out my spare room and there's always an archaeologist in it. I live in Lincoln and there just seems to be a stream of um, archaeologists coming through. And so I've always, uh, yeah, 
yeah, ninety percent of my lodgers have been archaeologists, and they're generally really, really good people to live with. Apart from all the muck, you, the bottom of the bath is always filthy. That's my only real sort of beef with people who are out digging all day and cleaning out the bottom of the bath and the bottom of the washing machine. Um, <laughs> But other than that, they're generally very good crack. Um, so thank you ever so much for having me here today. Um, I think I've been asked here today because um, we have recently, at the Woodland Trust, changed an element of the MPPF, the National Planning Policy Framework. And that sort of, it, even though it's sort of not a directly an archaeology point, I think it's a point in terms of you can change policy. So um, my story, it sort of, ends with cake because that's what we wanted. Basically what we wanted was equal protection for the natural and built environment. Um, but from, um, from an e ecology point of view, we felt that ancient woods and trees should have the same protection as, as the built environment. So a little bit about the Woodland Trust. Um, we've been around for about 40 years. We've got about half a million members and supporters. We have three main aims. We want to work with others to plant more woods and trees. We want to protect native woods and trees and we want to get people out there and enjoying them. We work very closely with DEFRA, giving away free trees for schools and community groups. Um, anyone at this time of year can apply for a free tree pack. You can have up to 130 free trees from us and DEFRA and go out and plant them in your local community. And um, we've also got a pretty huge estate. We own over 1,250 sites across the UK. Um, some of those are tiny little scraps of urban woodland, and then we've got some really massive estates up in Scotland, which you can walk around for days. They're great places. Um, so I'm here to talk about ancient woodland, which is our main policy focus. So I know ancient woodland is of interest to archaeologists because it's generally pretty undisturbed. Um, that is the joy of ancient woodland. You, me, as a non-archaeologist, can see how people have used them over hundreds of years, how they've always been working environments, and how just me as a layman can see that. But I know that they are of great interest to archaeologists when you speak to people who actually know a little bit more about what to look for. Um, but basically, it's because they're unmanaged, in terms of the habitat value, they're incredibly important. They've just, it's just that... The way, the way they've been looked, they, they, the undisturbed soils is what it comes down to. They've been managed in different ways over the years, but it's just, it's kept that unique habitat. So, but why are they important? The UK is the least wooded country in Northern Europe. It has less than 3% of the, of the UK is ancient woodland. And ancient woodland links back to the old wildwood that we had since the last ice age, since before the last ice age. Um, so, since, no, since after the last ice age, sorry, I'm going to get corrected on these things by, by, by a group of archaeologists. Um, so it's really, as I said, it's really special because of the habitat it creates. It's also com a completely irreplaceable habitat and a really magical place to disappear to. Um, last week I took the planning policy team from MHDLG out for their away day into one of our woods, Hainault Forest, on the edge of London. And... Um, they were really entranced by it, and it was really, it was really nice to see that. And um, ancient woodland, the image you generally have of it is a lovely carpet of bluebells, um, but it's just saying that there are two different types of ancient woodland as defined in England. If you go up to Scotland, they have multiple types of ancient woodland, which all gets very, very complicated. But in England, we're quite straightforward. We have ancient semi-natural woodland, which is the beautiful green that you imagine, and we also have pools plantations on ancient woodland sites. So this is basically, sort of, since sort of the, in the 20th century, particularly around the First and Second World War, when we realised that we were running out of timber, the Forestry Commission um, came about and they basically chopped down, clear felled an awful lot of ancient woodland. So instead of wasting valuable agri uh, agricultural land, they thought, well, we've got these woods already, we might as well clear fell them, replace them with conifers. And so they've still got those undisturbed soils that we look for in, a, in an ancient woodland. But as you can see, it's all about the light levels are completely different. It's, it, and so the biodiversity is... Apparently red squirrels prefer them, but I think they're about the only things that prefer them. Um, so we do a lot of work in terms of restoring plantations on ancient woodland sites. 
And our big thing is to get planners to realise that they have actually got the same level of protection in planning policy and guidance. Because I know that when I worked in local authority, I'd have wandered around this wood. This is exactly the same wood, it's just where, where the change is. I'd have wandered around here and just gone, this is just a plantation, we're not interested in this. And it's trying to get people un to understand the value of it, that if you manage the light levels properly, it can be restored back to that ancient semi-natural. Uh, there's also um, wood pasture, open grown trees, something else to think about. And not forgetting um, ancient trees. We all love ancient trees and any excuse to go out for a bit of tree hugging. Um, I wanted to pick up, pick up on what Lord Renfrew was saying earlier. Ideas don't, I really like this quote, ideas don't start in Westminster or Washington, that's just where they end. It's really that sort of power to the people that we have got to take the initiative to take the ideas to Westminster and that's when the, the action can happen and they can become policy and legislation but we've got to push them there in the first place. Um, so at planning point of view, um, the, 2012 was a big, big year for planning and we all, we thought the end was nigh and we all got very upset and um, it it was it was quite upsetting. Um, we like to keep the mystique. We have thousands and thousands of pages of policy and guidance, and then suddenly they were going to cram it down to fifty pages. And planners, uh, we didn't like that. Um, but in a, um, for ancient woodland, it wasn't actually too bad. It very much maintained the status quo. The problem was the status quo wasn't that great. We had in the MPPF. Um, planning permission should be refused for development resulting in the loss or deterioration of irreplaceable habitats including ancient woodland and the loss of aged or veteran trees found outside ancient woodland unless the need for and benefits of the development in that location clearly outweigh the loss. And to be honest you can drive a bulldozer through that and that was the problem. So we had hundreds and hundreds of ancient woodlands that were be being developed into fancy housing estates, caravan parks, um, paintballing sites, all sorts of things. And this is something that we have been picked up on and we've been fighting ever since. So this, we've had, it's been going on for 20 years previously, but we just felt that this, we didn't lose the protection that we had previously in the PPGs, which was great, because I know a lot of other areas of policy suffered, but we were still very disappointed that it wasn't a step forward. We believe that every policy change should be a step forward rather than just maintaining that status quo. Um, so we kept working to gather our evidence base um, working with lots of communities, we have a Woods Under Threat group who they basically we have local communities who are all over the country going through planning lists, working out where these threats to ancient woodland are and collating them all. Um, also, we're the only ones that actually collate ancient woodland loss in this country. Um, Natural England don't record it, so we're we're the only ones that keep that record. And so we were basically coming lobbying from all angles, trying to get. Our, um, our manifesto for ancient woodland into policy and <coughs> before we got to policy we got it in to the Tories last manifesto which is really really great to get it in there so we had something to always go back at them but it's in your manifesto why you know you should be doing this and it's really good to have that hook and then we were thrilled to get it um, improved protection for ancient woodland and trees into the 25 year plan so again we had another policy hook to keep grappling people with and so then in March 2018, we had the draft which was published, and this was brilliant. It was a really good step forward, but the problem was it excluded ancient woods and ancient trees. So we had this improved policy for ancient woodland, but it did nothing in terms of ancient trees. It didn't take, it didn't take them further forward. It just went back to the old policy that the benefits should not outweigh the loss, and the, the benefits needed to outweigh the loss and that just wasn't good enough. So we went into full campaigning mode, and as Lord Renfrew said earlier, we did a lot of work with our APPG, which we've set up a few years earlier. Um, we have an AP, uh, there is an APPG which we provide the Secretariat for, um, for ancient woods and trees, and I would just reinforce what he said earlier, so that they are really, really brilliant avenues of policy um, lobbying opportunities. So this is Rebecca Powell, our chair, and she <coughs> managed to get the then planning minister, um, Dominic Rubb, to come and talk to us. And it was a really good opportunity, and we sat eyeball to eyeball arguing about ancient trees. And 
and why they needed this extra push to get this extra level of protection. And the fact that he sort of stood up and posed next to our banner, it was it was a really quite a powerful thing. And I don't think we would have got that opportunity if it wasn't through going down the APPG route and trying to engage those those keen parliamentarians. And we're just so so thankful for their help. Um, but there was that sort of the, the public lobbying going on and the lobbying of parliamentarians. And then there was an awful lot of frantic emails going back, backwards and forwards between myself and, and the civil servants at MHCLG. Um, because as part of the write around process, that everything that they write, it has to go around every single other department. And so they were getting pressured from DEFRA that to, get to, to get their manifesto commitment into the MPPF, they had to deliver on this. But then equally, the Treasury were going, uh, we need to be, build, be building more houses. How does this stack up? And we only got to met, meet with the Treasury once. They generally don't like the tree huggers to meet the Treasury. Um, <laughs> but we got in there once. And um, <coughs> we're just trying to make, make the point that these, these ancient trees don't have to stop the development. And the Treasury keep coming back to us and saying, but they just pop up, they pop up everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just saying, they're, they're ancient trees. Some of these trees are thousands of years old. Honestly, housing estates pop up everywhere. <laughs> ancient, trees, ancient trees do not pop up everywhere. So we spent a lot of time, it's all about the evidence base and then trying, to, so they've got the arguments that they can justify MHCLG, it's empowering the civil servants at MHCLG. Um, and by this time we were working really, really closely with them and they could sort of phone us up in a state of panic. We're meeting the Treasury tomorrow, can you give us X, Y and Z? And then I'd go back to the office and we'd all throw everything in the air and crack on with trying to provide more evidence. But it's sort of where these trees are to the best of our knowledge. Obviously that is, we, we, we run the inventory and we, but we rely on members of the public to um, measure and feedback and input any ancient and veteran trees. Um, and then also we list and measure the number of trees by county, but then by all the different threats. And so we had reams and reams and reams and reams of these and to show them where, what the threats were. And um, we also got 12,000 members of the public engaged with the campaign. So 27,000 people responded to the MPPF consultation and 12,000 of those were on ancient and veteran trees saying that they needed the same protection as ancient woodland. And so it was, it was a huge, it was one of the biggest campaigns that we've ever run. And I must say, I'm really, really planning, I'll say it myself, isn't the sexiest topic. The MPPF isn't even the sexiest element of planning. But to, to get 12,000 people to stand up and say, yeah, we recognise this is really, really important. And it, it's such a big shift because planning is generally, it's all about threats and people get, get, get engaged when the ancient tree next to them is under threat. It's very hard to get them thinking about that as a sort of preemptive thing. And so this was a huge step forward. And so the lobbying continued. We sort of, this is our chair and um, chief exec and they nobbled the good and the great wherever they found them, which was awesome. <laughs> Um, we also got the, um, the industry engaged. Um, we had a, um, countryside homes who are, they are, I think, the seventh biggest house builder in the country. They gave us some really good quotes and provided us with pictures. And they gave us a sort of package that we could pass on to um, MHCLG and the uh, Treasury. And we also got that from a number of arboriculturalists across the country saying that it is very much possible to develop, how, it all kept coming back to housing, housing is the big concern, that it is possible to build new housing estates without um, compromising ancient trees. And also saying how much they add to the value, that they add to that feeling of space. Um, and I was planting a tree with um, James Brokenshire, the um, current Secretary of State, at MHCLG yesterday and sort of again pestering him about planting more trees in uh, new developments and he said he's really interested in creating more of a sense of place and a sense a really sense of belonging in these new communities that we're building and it's sort of trying to get the tree angle in there um, so eventually in July um, we got what we wanted we got 
cake for 400, <laughs> which was awesome. Um, we were at, it literally, this, this comes after 20 years of campaigning. It, it's the, the biggest, the, the, one of the biggest achievements we've ever had. Really, really thrilled. Um, so we um, are now on a par with the historic environment. Um, so basically, development resulting in the loss and deterioration of irreplaceable habitats should be refused unless there are wholly exceptional reasons and a suitable compensation strategy exists. Obviously, we're not a huge fan of this footnote and um, we, will <coughs> we will keep lobbying on this. And we've got massive issues with High Speed 2 and a lot of infrastructure projects. Um, but it is something to keep fighting, but it's something that we will keep, keep trying to progress, but it is a massive, massive, massive step forward. And I really just wanted to sort of use this as an example that you can actually get there with policy change. It, when I first started at the Woodland Trust, they took me on specifically to change this policy. I had one KPI, and my KPI was change national policy. And it was just like that, that it, all, all, my, all my friends who, who sort of have pl proper planning jobs um, thought it was a, a bit of a joke. Um, but it's just to really say that it, it can be done. And I know from living with lots of archaeologists that um, they, you have lots of concerns around policy, particularly the MPPF, and, but there, there is scope there. And so here it is um, ending in Westminster with our um, friends at our APPG. Um, that's our, our chair again, Re Rebecca. Uh, Michael Fabricant has also been really awesome. He's, he's been involved through High Speed 2. So it's sort of finding what people are interested in, other threats, and going, oh, you're interested in High Speed 2. That's going to wipe out an awful lot of ancient woods and trees. Come and be our friend. Um, so, um, yeah, and Lord, Lord Framington, who is awesome. We love Lord Framington because he's an agriculturalist by trade. Um, and so that is me. And... Uh, <laughs> We've, we've had a big rebrand this year that we have to be more edgy and engaging. So this is actually, this is not me, this is our official sign-off. So, um, yeah, there we go. I'll leave, you, I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Chris Patrick. I, I'm not the other two, I am an archaeologist and my bath is spotless, so uh, <laughs> this is an opening down bit before we get, get the show rolling. Um, I um, am Principal Conservation Officer at Birmingham City Council. Um, my background is an, is an archaeologist, as I said. Um, starting off working in field work for Birmingham University, um, other commercial units, um, then up to the County Council in Worcestershire. Um, then working as the archaeologist in Coventry before eventually becoming the uh, conservation and archaeology officer for Coventry. So you can sort of see what happened there that I had uh, two qualifications and somebody uh, in the uh, somebody spotted this. Um, and now I am the conservation officer for Birmingham, but also covering uh, building conservation and also it seemed to be, seemed to um, inherited archaeology and an HER as well. So I think it's probably fair to say that my skill set has been rather forged. In, in the fires of local government austerity. Um, talking about the, um, it's going to be quite a, the person, it's going to be a personal view, although I'm sort of members of, um, of, the, of the, the new candidates, IHBC, um, CIFA, IFA, and involved with the Association of Local Government Archaeological Officers. As they often say in sort of Twitter disclaimers, uh, this does not necessarily affect the views of my employers. <laughs> but um, we should crack on. Looking <laughs> largely, again, quite a West Midland centric. Air, um, talk looking at particularly mainly the, the issues that I, I come across on a regular basis affecting our particular area, both the actual sort of um, West Midlands conurbation, uh, Coventry, Birmingham, and the Black Country, and then also maybe branching out to some of the rural counties that's, that's, uh, that surround this. Um, so, for those who don't know, um, what does a local <coughs> what does, um, a historic environment service actually do? Now, a reason, a reason I'm bringing this up is that I f frequently meet uh, archaeologists on site that, to be honest, aren't totally sure how the planning system works, exactly why they've actually ended up on site doing what they do. So I'm assuming that not everybody probably knows exactly what goes on. Um, so the main key point is that most of this country's historic environment 
is guarded by the um, work of the, of the planning system, uh, whether it be archaeology in particular, um, listed buildings, um, conservation areas, uh, and so forth. And our job really is to give advice to the planners on planning applications it's about to ensure that archaeology um, is identified and, 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 and mitigated, listed buildings hopefully are sort of retained and reused, conservation areas uh, again are, are, are preserved, preserved and maintained. And I think really, I think the other draw point, point, point to this is, that is the nature of the specialist nature of this role. And I haven't seen in quite a few areas now, you see, um, I, think, I think Ealing was a case down in London where the local authority decided that they no longer needed a, a conservation officer and that the, um, the planning officers they had already had these skills within their skill set. And I think unless they're exceptionally lucky, that is not likely to be true. I think it is quite a specialist role. It does need specialist input to actually understand what you are looking at. Um, the other job of the local authority is uh, maintaining historic environment record. Now, this really is the cornerstone of historic environment <coughs> policy in, in local government uh, in, 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 in Britain. And this is this depository of information that basically says what's where and uh, whether it be any heritage, heritage assets. And all local authorities should have one of these and should maintain one of these. We'll come on to that later. Um, the other job is to contribute to um, local plans and local policy documents. And again, I think we talk about um, national policy in terms of uh, MP MPPF. There's also obviously a large tier of policy that sits below that in terms of local plans, going right down to SPDs, conservation area appraisals, and that sort of thing. And on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, although the principles are set at quite a high level, what you're actually um, doing on a local level, it, it tends to be quite diff tends to be much more focused and much more relevant to that area. Um, enforcement action as well, who polices it? So when people don't play the game, when people do um, damage archaeological sites, when people um, do um, start dismantling listed buildings, who's there to stop it? And again, if the role of the local, local uh, sorry, environment service is a crucial one on that. Enforcement guys are not specialists. How do they know if an archaeological site's been damaged or not? It takes someone on site to see to really go on site and assess this. Um, advisors on local government uh, property as well, in terms of whether it be landscapes like parks, whether it be woodlands, whether it would be um, local authorities own vast quantities of listed buildings, quite a number of highly graded listed buildings that Coventry and Birmingham City Council own, usually through being requested them by uh, other people who don't want them, it's quite, it's quite incredible. And they are really become quite a burden now. And you're also seeing quite a lot of these things now being foisted off onto community groups and things like that. And it's very hard to secure that we, least, that we just you have a long-term plan for these things and they're not just being sort of foisted off. I think lastly as well, we are... Sorry, get my drink. We're the, we're the um, sort of the acceptable face of local government as well. We are um, usually the rather go-to people that are seen as slightly sort of outsiders perhaps. And the people that do genuine, genuinely care... And I think in terms of planning, which is quite a faceless thing, to actually have a face like that um, in a planning department is actually an extremely positive thing for a local authority. So moving on to the MPPF, uh, what it means for heritage. Uh, I think we've touched on this already, really, um, about we've seen the sort of the rather piecemeal way that local that, um, policy in Britain has rather sort of evolved. Um, the giant step leap forward of, of PPG 15, 16, <laughs> Then, sadly, to the Heritage Act that never happened, actually. That it always seemed to rather, rather forget about, really. And it's a great shame that didn't happen. And um, the fact it didn't happen also, again, draws on some of the points that were made earlier about government priorities and where Heritage stands in this. Maybe we're not a um, low priority, but we're certainly not at, not at the top tier. Um, then, looking at the MPPF, um, and yet uh, versions in 20, uh, 2012 and the most recent version, that's come out. I think a lot of us as well sort of considered whether um, this was a dumbing down of policy, uh, whether we're actually things were actually becoming uh, in uh, da danger just by being sort of uh, nibbled away at. And my general experience of the 2012 one is that it worked, has worked quite well. <coughs> I think a lot of those um, suspicions, as uh, Victoria pointed out, were largely unproven. Although a lot of things now are probably there seems to be a lot more sort of debate and sort of wriggle room, and some of that wriggle room isn't always terribly helpful. Um, as I said as well, the importance of local policy. Local, local, local authority has to set out a positive strategy for the um, historic environment. Um, 
And I think this is it, the need for strong, locally specific policies as well at ground level. Like when we were in Coventry, again, we were sort of identifying in our local plan what's important about Coventry. The medieval city and its archaeology, some of the post-war redevelopments and the cathedral and groundwork, things like this, trades like watchmaking and, and so forth. And by having that in policy, in that sort of document, then gives you a lot of leeway, then start hanging other things, whether it be requests for archaeological investigation, buildings you want to retain, that sort of thing. And that's, we found that extremely useful. Um, and it also mentions um, the historic environment is, is to be enjoyed. And it doesn't really sort of define you know, enjoyment in the um, MPPPF, but I mean, this is obviously something that can be uh, um, quite a kind of proactive way in terms of, you know, we look at maybe people running open days and things like that. But generally, I think the historic environment is enjoyed in a fairly sort of passive way. It is the world around us, it's the places we inhabit, and it's, it's every day. And I think everyone appreciates it, but not necessarily being completely aware that they are appreciating it, if that makes, uh, makes sense. Um, and finally, you can also look at things like heritage at risk, where we're, we're looking at building sites that are in trouble, identifying these sort of things and, and sort of targeting of action, whether it be for enforcement or, um, or, 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 or anything else, really. And a lot of that really isn't about shaming. I think a lot of it is really about um, giving it a higher profile. And finally, local designations. We also designate, you know, you know, we go forth and designate go conservation areas, as long as they actually have this degree standard. Can't just agree anything. It's not just a tool for sort of um, throwing in the way of any sort of development. Has to has to be good. And um, things like local listing as well, which again hooks it into things like policies. You really put your local plan of um, things that are locally specific and important to that locality. Um, historic environment records. As I said earlier, this is a real sort of cornerstone of, um, and I think. It's become a rather dynamic, it's, it's a dynamic resource in the historic environment. It's not some, something that has become rather, misunderstood, it's rather become rather misunderstood. It's a crucial part of the process. Um, at the most basic level, it's a blob on a map that will tell a planner that they should contact someone to basically have a, a, get, to get some advice on what the implications of the development will be, what, what are the impacts. Um, because again, local, a local planning authority has to have access up to, up to date evidence on the historic environment. And that up-to-date bit is really important. We can't just um, have something that lives in a cupboard. I think, and I think this is another thing that's sort of um, another problem that's really coming up, that a lot of the local authorities now will claim to have an HER. Now, the HER may not have somebody that's there actually maintaining it, though. And if that is not being maintained, then really the use of it is rather limited. And I think that this is really important. I mean, it's a bit like me. Sort of, I've got a rusty axe in my shed. That doesn't mean I'm a lumberjack. Just because you've got a, an HDR in the cupboard somewhere. <laughs> it's that sort of um, publicly accessible. <clears throat> I think the other thing about it as well is that it, it is public, to be publicly accessible. It's got, and it actually, in the definition in the MPPF, is a, a, a beneficial public, a public benefit and use. And it is really one of the main vehicles for actually engaging people in the historic environment, engaging locals, people coming to you with information to receive it, then going out and then bringing information back into it. And it's very much a sort of two-way path. And finally, the sort of um, strain of the MPPF on the heritage section anyway is the determining development proposals, where um, applicant has to describe the significance, you know, what is this thing, why is it important. It has to consult the HER as a minimum. Hmm. Doesn't always happen. But uh, again, quite specific in MPPF. And then local, authority, local, uh, local planning authority takes into account the desirability of sustaining enhancing that significance. That's what we've got to bear in mind. So it's significance, we've got to think about how um, that we're going to enhance that. And we've got to give great weight to the conservation of the heritage assets. And then harm, should it occur through that impact, needs clear and convincing justification. And I think really, I think this is one of the things now where it's a bit like we're looking at the sort of tree, um, the Woodlands Trust sort of thing. It's sort of, you know, it's, it's good policy and it looks quite sound. But then again, how exactly is that applied? Is, uh, and uh, you get all other sort of, um, that's, and it comes down to that sort of harm, the public benefit. Does the harm even inflict upon that have public benefits that reflect that? And I think the case, there's now a whole sort of sub-industry in heritage which has sort of evolved now to argue the toss about these things, really. And whether harm versus um, public benefit, harm versus public benefits, what the harm is, what, what the public benefits is. The fact that arguably um, the, 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 the historic environment has public benefits too, 
versus the public benefits of maybe building a housing estate and housing, and how we balance those things out. When in fact, there's probably a middle way with a lot more collaboration that could also be successful. Um, the last 10 years, I'm getting, I'm getting, there's been a massive decline in local government staff. It's been a pretty tough period. So nationally, these are the Algoria figures, 35% less archaeological and conservation staff across the country. Now, I would actually say that looking at the West Midlands, as in our accommodation, that is possibly, um, give, doesn't give a quite um, accurate picture. I would say, just on the way totting down, thinking back to meetings I was going to in the sort of early 2000s, that there were probably, including conservation officers, archaeological officers, and HER officers working in, in the West Midlands, I would say you probably had about 27, 28 people. Now I think we're down to about eight or nine, and that is across one, two, four, seven local authorities. So you can see the massive, we're looking at that's probably nearer 70% than the actual 35%. So that's uh, twice what the national figures suggest. And obviously this has a massive impact upon the advice that's given, and the advice that's given uh, affects the, um, the preservation of, of the historic environment. There's um, loss of expertise and redundancy for retirements. Again, if you were over, a few years ago, if you were over 50, you were stable, HR was straight probably on you to sort of think, well, you're close to retirement, you've been here 30 years. And a lot of staff went out the door at that stage, and a lot of, a lot of valuable knowledge, was, knowledge went. We're at the stage now where some authorities have um, no archaeological advisors or some have no conservation officers. I think uh, Coventry now only has an HR officer. Uh, Birmingham, we have um, t two um, conservation officers, myself included. Um, well, areas like Sandwell don't really, have, but Walsall don't have anybody at all. And either borrow staff on a case to case basis or you, do consult you bring consultants in. Um, again, some historic record, environment records are not being maintained. And again, this is a serious problem because up to date evidence is not going to be there. Without that up to date evidence, you're in trouble. And so, once this comprehensive coverage that existed, comparatively recently, in the 90s, I think was, I'd almost sort of look upon this as a, as a, high, a high point for the historic environment um, in, in, in Britain in terms of provision. Uh, this has become now rather very, very patchy, and particularly in some areas, particularly um, <coughs> urban areas, I would say. And I think a similar pattern picture has been displayed in areas like Merseyside and elsewhere, um, although fluctuating. And um, it only really comes to people's attention when something actually goes wrong and captures people's um, captures the public attention. We've also got museum services under, under strain. Again, we're probably um, to, we're fortunate in some ways. We have actually got museums that are still willing to take archaeological archives in, in Coventry and Birmingham and places like that. But that's not necessarily true across um, the rest of the area. In terms of dedicated archaeologists in um, local museums, I think we're, we're down to, um, ha to a handful now. And that is a problem in terms of, you know, because they're just receiving boxes and they're not always doing a great, a great deal with it. Then where's the public access and where's the um, synthesis and educational use of these things? And I think finally, because there's less people there doing these works, this links to the public and the, public, um, the support the public give is gradually being eroded away and it's not quite um, it's not, not, what, not, what it is, not what it should be. So I'm looking at sort of pitfalls of um, application of policy. Um, I, think we, I think we forget sometimes that sort of well, the system we operate in now is actually a very, it's still quite a young system, isn't it? And it's only been going since the early 1990s. I think we assume that this is this thing that's sort of been a, that's there and, is, uh, and is, is there forever. And although I'm not saying that it's sort of hanging by a thread, I think we are sort of, um, it, it is fragile. And I think when we have times as we are, that we are in now, and I think we're, as again was talking about earlier about the worries of um, where policy is going, what happens with Brexit and this sort of thing, it is one of these sort of lower priority things that could very much disappear off the radar unless we're particularly vigilant about it. I think we're particularly vulnerable um, when, in times of economic um, instability, where um, uh, there's probably people furiously lobbying for um, things to be planning system to be simplified. When um, and obviously some, perhaps at the whims of politicians, these things could disappear quite quickly unless, unless uh, people take um, a vigilant and uh, apply pressure. Um, and there's also concern, I think, whether the um, MPPF policy on assessing significance, harm and impact is being followed. I think there's a very interesting report that came out by Historic England a few months back that suggests that it isn't always being uh, applied as it should be. 
and there's certainly a very sort of heavy um, when when uh, something historic environment comes up in the sort of um, um, harm versus public benefit justification that the historic environment does and doesn't disproportionately come out on the losing side. Um, HERs have not always been consulted. Um, considering the number of planning applications that come across uh, my desk, the ones that actually have been consulted the HER and HER searches that are basically asked for um, is, is very, very, very low, I, I would say. Although the things that come in that come in through um, um, major schemes with archaeological contractors involved tend to be the ones that, that are then the quality is good. Poor quality information being submitted, again, I think Archaeologically, it's not too bad. I think we have, we have decent contractors. I think we have DBAs that aren't always what they could be. And I think we really get the society so desk-based desk -based assessments, which is the opening, early sort of opening stage of archaeology. And um, they're probably not as, as good as they could be. And a lot of the time, we get information just regurgitated at, at, at us. But then I don't know, sometimes I wonder whether the purpose of desk-based desk assessments is more for the clients um, and the developers than it is actually for ourselves to tell us something new. Um, Lack of expert advice, I can think of a district in Warwickshire, for instance, that uh, no longer receives archaeological advice. And um, certainly Birmingham, until quite recently, um, had, hasn't had an archaeologist for several years. And again, you're looking at so when non-experts, all I've got to go on really are sort of blobs on maps, and archaeological conditions are probably being attached to things that probably don't need to be attached to. While conversely, I think you're probably um, other, signs and other sites and things like that are now being, are now being missed, and it's not happening. Um, Looking at the sort of um, the drive to, okay, sorry, I'll go back to say the other thing as well. Obviously, from a developer point of view, if people are getting special advice, and if that special advice is, not, is then leading to conditions that aren't really necessary, then that's tremendously bad publicity for archaeology, for asking people to do work that really doesn't really provide, is adding absolutely nothing to the process. Um, in terms of, there's also been a massive drive in recent years to cut red tape um, and has this damage protection. And I think. There are, yeah, I mean, I, th and I think there is an issue with it. I think one of the things, for instance, uh, pre-commencement conditions are become much more of an issue now. Um, developers have to sign up for them, and if you don't, people don't sign up for them, then you've got to refuse the planning application. But then again, the clash pressure from um, probably from politicians and planners to approve it. Are you, are you, going, to, are you going to refuse a fairly major scheme just because they haven't done the archaeological work? I don't know. The proof is going to be there. But I think there's the, there's the, there's the, the risk that these things aren't going to be kept followed through. And I think simply, to be honest, that you're not going to solve the nation's economic um, issues and the housing crisis by uh, fiddling around with archaeological conditions. It's a much, much bigger problem. And I think right, and, uh, it's carrying rather huge risks to, um, to, to, to this historic environment that really it's nothing to do with. Um, and should more be done to accentuate public benefits? Absolutely, definitely. I think this is one thing that possibly being levelled at people from time to time is what is the benefit? I mean, I think, I mean, I would say the public benefit is, is present through absolutely everything that we do. Um, I think sometimes it's explicit, maybe it may well be things like uh, something in the press or the open days or publicity or that sort of thing, um, or, local, or activities with local groups. But I think a lot of the time it is a fairly sort of passive thing. Again, people appreciate um, that this is involved, a lot of this involved with placemaking. Um, they appreciate um, the heritage, they, they may not do it explicitly, but um, it is there. I, I don't think we, every time we sort of um, put a TPO in a tree or a big excavation site, I'm not expecting people to rush out and hang garlands around me in gratitude, but I think there is this sort of testimony that they are um, agreement that it, that it is for the public benefit. And again, I think something that's also undersold really since the last uh, 25, 30 years is the sheer amount of archaeological data that has been provided. And again, I think we were talking earlier about the sort of heroic age of excavations that were carried out in major cities, uh, Winchester, Canterbury, and so forth. But that generally was the exception. I think there was a lot of spaces in between. We were looking at exceptional sites and doing exceptional work in circumstances. But um, a lot of other towns were really, and places were being missed out completely. So now we have a much, much bigger picture. I think that is largely due, almost entirely due, to developer-funded archaeology and some tremendous benefits and that knowledge that we now possess. Um, so are we caught in a bit of a vicious circle, I think. This is it where it cuts local authorities. Um, there's less time with the public, less time to do the sort of, maybe the sort of nicer things than more the local authorities. I remember look, looking back fondly when I used to be able to put half a day aside to go field walking with the local society. That doesn't happen now. So 
less time um, with the public, less support, but that results in more um, cuts and puts in more deeper problems. Um, I think it's hard to get people on site as well these days. I think you have major excavations and projects and things like HS2 where it's just impossible to get people on site for a whole host of reasons, and that's not unreasonable. But um, I don't really think it does us a great deal of favours. Um, and again, public benefits are often seen by developers as a bit of a fluffy add-on when um, for a little, for a tiny bit more effort, it wouldn't be hard to actually make a heck of a more, a more um, impact and difference. Um, and local authorities can make huge contribution, contributions when engaged. I mean, we had in again in Coventry, the NHLF funded projects going out looking at um, surrounding countryside, archaeological field work, surveying, field walking. The results of that were fed back into the HER, and the results of that were then used um, in the formation of the local plan. So we have this sort of circular exercise where local where local people going out putting putting uh, information into the planning system that did actually make a genuine difference. And again, small, small discoveries are significant too. Again, um, Stonehenge is obviously a national, um, internationally important monument, but what often captures people's imagination is um, often small stuff. And again, in Coventry, what, one of the most things that probably caught the most interest was a house that burnt down in 1940 and collapsed into a basement and the excavation of that and pulling out day-to-day -day objects. So I think really, I, th I think we can't just aim at sort of the, the big stuff. The little stuff as well also captures imagination, perhaps more so in a way that um, more remote things don't. Um, and I think finally we need to be better at telling stories. We seem to have lost this. We seem to have lost the sort of um, uh, narrative. We need to be better really at creating synthesis and, t and telling the stories. And I think that also aids us in terms of being able to say why we want archaeological work to happen. Uh, decision makers, we need to educate um, senior people, uh, council officers, planners and politicians about the value of the historic environment and policy. And also, if you're going to make policy, the value of actually sticking to policy and not sort of trying to make exceptions to things and trying to hold the line. I think also the worry is as well that um, we have local authority um, staff. If you, if you, if you, what's the penalty? If you, don't have, if you don't necessarily follow your own rules, you could get called in, I suppose, but generally you don't. If you don't have um, local authority staff, what's, what's the penalty for that? Well, things might go wrong, but again, as we said, people don't tend to complain about things going to, to, to that until things do go wrong. And um, word gets around, so one authority realises it's got no archaeological staff, others start thinking, <coughs> well, they've got away with it, we could probably do that as well. And I think the worry is that we're quite a historic environment staff, we're also quite a soft target for, for cuts and so forth. Um, in many areas, the country now are desperate for investment, and this sort of that sort of heritage in some way is, is, is sort of holding them back and, uh, and growth trumps all and that's a very, very difficult argument to when I think generally heritage based <coughs> generation is also often most, most, most successful and popular. Um, old cliches about delays caused by archaeology and excessive costs of historic buildings, they still persist. I don't know exactly where they come from, particularly in the way that um, the archaeological profession has now developed and you have contracts that work, contractors that are working extremely professionally and delivering things on deadline. Um, to cost uh, and so forth, but it's these myths still perpetuate, and again, they're, they're very unhelpful. Um, and the message is that you know, there's the positive messages really are still struggling to be heard. So, to finish off, what can be done? Well, I think it's been, I think it's the uh, um, uh, RTPI has also said recently the planning system needs to be properly. Resourced. It can't just be about firefighting. You're not going to get good policy, good decisions, and good outcomes without people actually there that know their stuff doing these sort of jobs. And I think that applies to a whole range of fields, but certainly in terms of um, archaeological officers, conservation officers, HERs, that sort of thing. Um, I think the need to shout about the stroke environment policy, policy you know, uh, as a chief for the public. Again, tremendous, ben tremendous benefits in terms of information, in terms of building save, uh, and so forth. Um, statutory status for historic environment services well again it's one thing to think the Heritage Act did, did, what didn't go through and we, we don't have statutory HERs and, and things like that because I think that probably would um, <coughs> greatly assist um, maybe, maybe it will happen maybe it won't probably not but um, consider other service other deli delivery mo mo models um, outsourcing I mean that's been done a lot in local government but generally I think if that was a workable system for heritage, it probably would have happened by now. 
Um, and probably there's not a tremendous amount of interest in actually doing that because of the sheer range of tasks that historic environment specialists and local government do. And it's more than just here looking at planning applications. Um, as I said earlier, I, th I think the other thing as well, talking about combi maybe combining services. But I think the risk of combining services is that you spread yourselves too thin. But that's not to say that maybe a, a um, HR for the whole of the West Midlands might not, be, might not work and might not be a good thing. Um, and charging as well. I think charging for it, it costs money to run a planning service, and again, if you want the quality, you've got to pay for it. And I think that's probably a big element, say, for greater charges. Um, need to educate decision makers, whether this be planners, whether this be local politicians. I think Historic England have tried, I think with mixed results, um, with sort of historic heritage champions and that sort of things. And um, uh, but I think that we really need to really persist that. Um, historic environment needs advocates in order to influence. And I think that's one thing that came across looking at um, talk, uh, Victoria's talk earlier, was we, have, we need to get better at campaigning. And I think really have you know, um, organisations like Rescue that probably could be those, those sorts of people that could, that could sort of organise and start pushing for these things. Um, synthesis for archaeological work, again, we're going to need to be better at telling stories. We need to be able to justify what we do and say that we're doing, that we're doing A, B, C and D because we want to learn this. And I think that would be really much more appreciated. Um, again, stress the role of having somebody on the ground. Be productive with public engagement, greater work for developers, contracts, museums and archives. And basically, stuff that's coming out of the ground, what, what are we going to do with it? Putting away in sad boxes is not going to be the future. We can't really. It's not sustainable. So, at the end, really, I, I, I don't think you know, my message would be don't throw the baby out of the bathwater. This system has worked very, very well. It's achieved a lot. And we're now victims, I think, probably rather unfortunate <coughs> economic circumstances and then sort of political drivers that have then have been occurring since then. So, I think a lot has been achieved. We've really got to start celebrating that and start, start shouting about it a bit more. And uh, I think otherwise, we're going to end up taking some rather rash and unfortunate decisions that really are going, to, are going to be totally unjustified. So that's it, thank you. Hugely keen, basically, on, on the power of our heritage to strengthen society in many, many ways. And um, I've always believed that we could do things better. I think that's where, that's where I'm coming from. I've always meddled. I meddled in setting up Southport. Um, I've meddled in... Um, setting up the Paris conference a long time ago, watch this space for the next Paris conference to look at preservation in situ, which is a strange concept in itself. But to today, um, we're not quite where we want to be. Um, and today is all about, I think, is this, is this the time to change? What kind of change should we, push in, should we be pushing for? Um, it's not because we can't make it work, as Chris was saying. I think we can make it work. We do. We have. We've made a lot work. But archaeology, in my view, is not delivering the sort of value that it should to the people whose inheritance we're actually studying. Um, we've talked about the, the making of an archaeological commercial market <coughs> from you know, extraordinary revelations, antiquarian revelations through post-war discoveries that actually seized the imagination um, had the Houses of Parliament talking through the rescue years where, where we really had some, sort of some adversarial battling um, and, and some significant changes. Moving then into the 70s and 80s with the code of practice, so developers and archaeologists coming together. Um, and then the major change um, using Huggin Hill, Bath House and the Rose Theatre and York as catalysts to bring about the planning policy guidance <coughs> note number 16 that we all recall um, and, and love. And then over the last 28 years, as Chris was saying, making a commercial services market that, that we made work. And I'm the first to admit that, um, you know, I spent a huge amount of effort in the early 1990s developing a kind of language that would help us talk to developers, a language around risk management. And we would build templates for appraising <coughs> risk and dealing with risk, because that's what our client sector really understood. And then we'd try and sort of bring the conversation around to talking about positive risks and benefits 
And we were really trying to sort of inch our way into their corporate social responsibility goals and objectives. That was our hook. Um, so at this particular site, One Poultry, in the, the heart of the city, um, we achieved fantastic things. We recognised the scheme's financial drivers. We came up with a top-down <coughs> policy where the, the, the ground floor slab went in and we were completely off the critical path of the development and excavating underneath. And, and the developer was starting to show quite remarkable interest in the project. It was a great victory. Um, and then the, gen, the then chairman of um, English Heritage described it um, quite publicly as, as you know what we'd somehow managed to achieve as uneasy bedfellows. And it wasn't meant to be a, a, a chairman of English Heritage knocking um, morning, but um, Lord Renfrew met, mentioned bumps in the ground, and it was the same. It was the same voice. Um, brilliant team, brilliant project, but still uneasy bedfellows. So, wouldn't it have been amazing if archaeology had nestled somehow within an alternative um, aspirational framework? Something about just about <coughs> knowledge or education or well-being, or about integrating and strengthening the identity of neighbourhoods or about curiosity. Um, and you have probably come across um, Dr Sarah Perry's recent blog um, exploring how archaeology can enchant the world through emotive engagement and how preferable that is to the sort of crisis model that we actually evolved. And if you haven't seen Sarah Perry's blog, um, I highly recommend you to take a look. And I believe there's a a publication forthcoming. Um, either way, wouldn't it have been amazing if we had been able to frame all that we were seeking to do within a process that really expresses value, the value that's actually embodied within our archaeological inheritance? We actually, what we did was approach things the other way around. And as, as I say, we've made the commercial archaeology work despite its fractures and under the planning framework I completely agree we've delivered some incredible remarkable outcomes and value um, for education for the economy for communities for society as a whole but I would say it hasn't been the norm so to take a step back for a moment um, where do we want to be where do we want to be in 2050 um, I think that we want to celebrate the uniqueness of place and we want to be informed by how places and people have in interacted over time. I think we want developers um, to embrace identity and difference and character and understand what heritage means to different people. Um, we want to combat the homogeneity and franchised branding of the high street experience of the, the 1970s. I think we want the uniqueness of heritage assets, which, which actually reach very deeply into different cultures and different people and different belief systems, to be right at the heart of, of our society. Um, accessible heritage, just like the highest quality architecture and landscaping, makes us actually curious, curious people, and it makes us think expansively about what we're doing here and what we want to do next on this planet. So I think we want uniqueness, we want also authenticity. Um, like Argent, working at the King's Cross development with local people, um, writing poems on the local fabric about what the place actually meant. You know, cities and histories beneath your pavements and cities behind your skies. We don't want this imported branding, rather we want special places and the recognition that an identity of a place is not a fixed thing, but it actually changes over time, and it arouses different emotions over time, and it makes <coughs> us care. Um, we know that places with strong and distinctive identities are far more likely to actually prosper than places without them. Um, Robert Solow said, every place must identify its strongest, most distinctive features and develop them or run the risk of being all things to all persons and none special to many. He described it as livability and he said it wasn't some middle class luxury, it was an economic imperative. 
So if we want our unique heritage to add value <coughs> to the lives that people lead, then where are we now? Um, recently, I'm sure some people in this room um, actively participated uh, in the series of workshops that uh, Historic England commissioned um, for the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists to deliver. And as part of that, I had a, a look back at what had been done in the wake of the recommendations from the Southport report, in, um, which was published in 2011. Um, genuinely, I was, I was absolutely astonished by how much work had been done, the sheer number of sometimes quite small but pivotal actions that a large range of organisations had, had, had carried out against the blueprint that we set out to deliver pl public benefit consistently from planning-led investigation of the historic environment. So organisations like Historic England and CIFA and the CBA and FAME and ALGEO and the British Property Federation had, had all been working consistently on some 80 um, different actions. Um, we've now got a far stronger set of standards in place, a far more solid foundation for commissioning work on the basis of what public benefit it's going to deliver. Uh, and yet, it seems in terms of the overall blueprint, if you like, for getting public benefit, we haven't really moved on that much further. We somehow seem still, and I think we're standing here today, probably later as well, banging the same drum that actually we were banging in, I can see nods, <laughs> in 2011. So what on earth is that about? I mean, the government statements, and the point's already been made, the government statements are pretty good, actually. They're saying the right things. I mean, that 2010 one, I hailed, I thought that was fantastic stuff, that the value of the historic environment will be recognised by all who have the power to shape it in a way that realises its contribution to the economic, social and cultural life of the nation, right where it should be, right at the heart of it. But seven years on, um, John Glenn's statement says good things too, and all credit to all the intensive lobbying and advocacy that's going on behind the scenes to craft these statements. They don't just arise afresh. Um, it says the right things. So that says to me the framework is there. Now, I'd just like to touch on Southport because it was born out of this huge enthusiasm um, for PPS5, which had just been published, which was saying lots of, lots of good things, but it seemed to herald this kind of opportunity. And I think, I think that opportunity is still there. <coughs> for, for those who weren't aware of Southport, it was a, it was a year-long cross-sector, well, pan-historic environment sector supported by the British Property Federation, um, consultation effectively, a series of workshops, consultation, it um, reached into different sectors, universities, the curatorial, <coughs> the contracting, the consulting, um, civic and amenity societies, spatial advocacy groups, all sorts. Um, and Historic England very kindly enabled um, the report to be, to be published. Um, the opportunity that we saw back in 2010-11 was that actually if we did some work ourselves we could achieve a major ground shift in how we approach and, and from my perspective quite narrowly the archaeological delivery of, of services but wider historic environment services. We thought we could go from just data collection, you know, preservation by record, to knowledge creation. We thought we could stop talking about archaeology as a risk and a cost and start talking about it consistently with our client sector as an asset. We thought we could move from actually a highly fragmented approach, which was the, 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 the fallout in the early noughties, to far greater collaboration. And we thought we could shift from what was being described as a, as a kind of market failure to looking at procuring services on the basis of, basis of quality. And we characterised that as being a shift from being an industry, which we had become in 1990, um, 
to being a recognised profession, with the key word there being recognised. In other words, we thought we'd take ourselves from this situation, and I think, Chris, that's where it's still coming from. We, we, we were effectively saying, we can do this really fast, we can get this archaeology out of the ground and away from you, where it won't cause a problem, and that's left a very, very significant legacy. That language has left a legacy. We would then pass the knowledge and all the things that we had uncovered on to third parties rather than facing our client sector. So we were kind of going around in this triangular market system. And we thought we could move from that to a situation where archaeological work always enriches the future through new understanding and new knowledge. And I think, I hope that you would agree that this, um, this vision is actually still right. I think this is still a good place to aim. So I guess my question today is, is the time now right? It perhaps wasn't the right time in 2010-11. Is the time now right with the benefit of a stronger historic environment sector and a stronger planning framework because the planning framework has a lot of energy behind it. So despite the fragilities that we, we all know about, it's a stronger framework. Can we now focus on sustainable, sustainable development and social value to reframe what we do in the context of value? Um, Southport looked at market value. We commissioned the London School of Economics to carry out some research and interview key development sector stakeholders. And although we understood how archaeology contributes to a sense of place and cultural identity and creates new skills and strengthens society, this wasn't being carried through to um, the value of development schemes. Um, the LSE report said that the, you know, the market price effectively um, only reflects the value to the individual purchaser. And even worse, properties with archaeological assets might actually have lower prices than sites without them because of the restrictions posed. Archaeologists are actually really good at creating high existence value. We investigate these heritage assets, we create and analyse data we make information and knowledge accessible, but actually in our sector as a whole, we're not so good at use value. The public is not normally um, involved in our investigations and results normally get published in less accessible um, uh, journals and, and, and other channels. Archives are normally stored with, you know, and, and can be quite difficult to get hold of, and they're often not publicised enough. So use value is actually something that we can really easily do something about. Um, there's a, a just published report last week, I think, from Nesta on valuing cultural um, uh, heritage, which looks at valuation in museums and cathedrals and historic cities, which is, which is well worth a look. Um, so meanwhile, we're talking to a developer sector who is looking at book value and yields and rental values and weighing up the option values of doing different things. They'll be thinking also about image value and cultural and environmental value, all of which can be achieved through heritage assets. Now, I just, I know I've got to wrap up. Um, Have three, three, three minutes. Really? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, there are all sorts of hooks available to us in the design and procurement and management of historic environment services. We've got um, the Treasury Green Book, the government's sustainable development drivers. Um, with an eye to Brexit, we've got the United Nations 17 goals for sustainable development, which are goals for the transformation of our world, um, and they too cover heritage. We've got things like... Um, Briam and SQL for civil engineering sustainability and the WELL standard for building sustainability. These are all useful hooks. The one I wanted to touch on um, is, is my particular interest in the Social Value Act, um, which came into force in 2013. Um, and 
is one of a number of pieces of legislation which at the moment um, is facing local authorities but has um, been heralded by the Minister for the Cabinet Office as something that's going to be strengthened and it's going to therefore become an explicit requ requirement. There are a lot of local authorities who are commissioning work on the basis of the social value that those, work can, those works can deliver, including, you know, Croydon's developed a toolkit, Oldham, Bath and North East Somerset, these Midlands have, have, have all picked up the Social Value Act. What might social value um, and benefit from archaeology actually look like? It might look like outreach, of course, so um, a, a contribution, even on a sensitive construction project like Crossrail, can reach out highly successfully, but it might also look like one of these other values, use social, economic, environmental, cultural value and image value. These are things that can um, be monetized in discussions with um, the client sector. They, we, and, and as we know, um, some of these um, some of these outcomes will be doing things like providing cohesion, will be animating spaces, will be unifying natural capital, um, the natural environment, will be um, will be tackling poverty, will be tackling social exclusion, um, will be unlocking new information. Um, the narrative and the power of storytelling has, has already been mentioned. Um, and I think that rather than just you know, using the, the stories to, tell, to, to draw people in and delight them, I think that narrative has a, a significant role to play in demonstrating social value. So I'm just going to wrap up with four quick points. Um, what we might do. Um, to maximise total economic value, I think we probably need to be looking at a toolkit or a practice paper um, to help us change the game if value is, is, is the way to go um, so that we can all move towards setting as our goals consistently to create outcomes, to create outcomes like records and publications and activities that produce use value so that it's more clearly recognised. And the reason I talk about something that sounds as boring as a practice paper is because we've got a lot of people in our sector to galvanise and move. And I think about the power of something like the Cunliffe Report or the power of something like MAP2 for actually moving the sector through something. Secondly, I really think we need to change the language. Um, we are about value and education and well-being, and we are contributors and creators and often multipliers of value. And when we animate a space, um, we are contributing to rental values and people's well-being, and we need to recognise that. Third, I think we should stop undermining ourselves with some of the work that we do, some of the behaviours that are actually around the previous archaeology market drivers. Unless we actually consistently approach archaeological work within the planning framework as a means of providing value to the public, then we'll continue to undermine the contribution archaeology can make to society. So, in other words, if we continue to design projects that mitigate impact, if we continue to design projects that preserve by record, then we're failing to actually design for a better future and we'll continue to undermine our ability to grow as a sector. Fourthly and finally, I, I, I echo all the points we need to rally and support high quality advocacy far more overtly. Um, speaking as, you know, one of 6,000, is it, or so archaeologists working in commercial archaeology, but probably only a small <coughs> fraction engaging with public um, policy development. It's a great fraction here, which is fantastic. But we do tend to leave it to Historic England and the CBA. The CBA was the only archaeological signatory I saw on the, um, on the um, forthcoming agriculture bill petition recently. And, and that's a huge thing. Historic environment and CIFA are now 
leading on that, along with Heritage Alliance and Rescue and the National Amenity <laughs> Societies, these, these advocacy voices are hugely important, and they often don't even really charge effectively for it. We've got to somehow lobby behind that. Um, it's vital. We actually, can I just say, we also do need an archaeologist on the Heritage Council. I believe we've got the Heritage Alliance on the Heritage Council, but boy, do we need an archaeologist as well on the Heritage Council. Um, I think that's pretty much it. it. We're in an era of of extraordinary pressure, extraordinary uncertainty. There's a huge demand for housing and infrastructure. But there's also a huge demand for sustainable places. And I think that that value that heritage can unlock is, is arguably the most powerful basis from which to actually forge this more caring society. Thank you. Um, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, th th there was a report recently by the British Academy that actually called for a single voice for archaeology, which I disagreed with entirely, because I think many voices are absolutely needed. And there are you know, national organisations um, and networks that enable that. There are membership organisations. Um, such as some of the ones that I mentioned, Rescue, obviously, and uh, the CBA and CIFA, and across other sectors as well. Um, so, yeah, the voices need to be put forward. And, and there is, a, if you look at um, Ipsos Mori polling information, there is a far stronger um, desire amongst young people particularly, to actually step up and make their voice heard than there's ever been before. And we were talking about Generation Z as well as millennials. And, but that's great. That is absolutely great. So, yeah. I'm really lucky because we had this really narrow point. And I think that's why we were successful. I think it's much harder if you've got a much broader us. So we work really closely with the RSPB, the National Trust, the Wildlife Trust, who've all got a bigger call. I think it's finding those key niches where you can make a difference. We're, we, we will be moving on to something else now to try and find, change something else. But I think you've just got to be so targeted. Maybe that's the bigger picture thing, which is you've got a big dream, but actually you do it in small steps, rather than saying yeah. everybody must love trees or archaeology. And, and it's, it's trying to get people engaged up front because everything always happens when there's a threat. Mm. And it, it's saying, look at what you've got now and getting people to appreciate it. And I think the problem with archaeology, it's great, you can go out and see trees and they're everywhere and that's awesome. Archaeology, it's mm. harder to sell because it's harder to see. It's not everywhere. In the, I'm sure it is, but we, me yeah. as a layperson can't see it. Except in the bath. Except in the bath, the bottom of my bath, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, dialogue is, is the way forward. I think a lot of these things just arrive fully formed on your desk and I think maybe some consultants don't quite realise what we want and the same rights and vice versa really. I think that's part partially because um, one has not worked in one field, one has not worked in, 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 in the other. And I think a lot of things like DBAs and information tend to, they're quite good at summarising history and that sort of thing but in terms of actual significance and impact it seems to sort of rather very sort of light and flaky. So Chris, how can that be fixed? What, Mark, what, so I know it's not easy to do, but presumably it's the ideas and the way that we might have to forward on that. I think probably need some sort of revised guidance, really. Okay. So, so from, who, from kind of a collective piece of guidance? I think it's going to be a, a, a sort of um, pan sort of sector agree agreement of um, collaboration between um, the local authorities, between um, consultancies, contractors, that sort of thing. and Because, um, like I said, I'm, I'm not honestly sure sometimes what they're actually, who they're being produced for. 
uh, whether it's for us or whether it's just um, the, the, the clients doing due diligence that there is, mm. they have looked and have taken that answer. Um, jump, jumping back to the other question about wages and that sort of thing, I mean, I, I totally agree. I mean, I think you're you seeing a lot of jobs that are advertised now for sort of, you know, if you want to work in Daventry two days a week, but then the field for people doing that is obviously going to be very, very narrow wanting that sort of job. But it, yeah, it, it, it is certainly a problem. I mean, you know, I was you know, lucky to have a full full time five days a week. That's my permanent contract. But I realised that it's not good for stability, um, either personally or in the whole sector, to have sort of part time, um, temporary contract jobs. Clara, do you have? A, I'm sure you have a perspective on that from one of your many hats. Past and present. Yeah, it's um, it's a value thing, mm -hmm. and it's very difficult to to value our own work as highly as it should be valued in a competitive world where you are suppressing your value by your behaviours. So, I'm I'm saying actually, if we can if we can get the recognition of the value of what our heritage delivers through the services that we deliver then there'll be more of a desired commodity. And so I think that's... it's not just the work itself, it's the kind of thinking of the wider benefits to the public, you mean well-being yeah, and absolutely. deeper understanding, more appreciation of things, is that yeah. the point you're making? Yeah. And Victor, I mean, you work in a parallel universe to us in many ways. I guess these are familiar arguments to you in terms of low wages within the sector and the competition there. For very the much so. I think there's a, a very much a sort of mirror between archaeology and ecology. Not, not so much the, the planning sector. I feel that there's, there's generally always jobs, apart from particularly bad downturns, there's always jobs in planning. But living with archaeology, I'm really shocked by the short-term nature of mm. contracts. The archaeologist who lives with me at the moment, her, her um, the company she works for, they pay her sub, um, subsistence mm. and her accommodation, but she gets moved around the country constantly she she moved about eight times in three months mm -hmm. and I just I don't in terms of commitment to the profession I think it'd be very hard to remain committed to the profession in that kind of lifestyle. Yeah I think it's a major issue I think that's to say that people actually working in our sector don't even don't really work exactly the how the planning system works and how people on archaeological sites and how they actually got there. So I totally appreciate, yeah, you're completely right, it's very difficult. And it's really about um, offering, trying to offer some sort of guidance to groups like that, whether you're offering guidance to parish councils, civic societies. Um, I'm not quite sure who's going to do that, whether it may be our, our RTBI or someone like that. I think yeah, those sort of um, charities, I think they do provide people that can comment on that sort of thing, but yes, it's a major issue. I guess, in a way, the point you're making is that a lot of people end, end the planning system as a threat-based thing, isn't it? And it's not rescue, you know, it's, it's that <coughs> approach. Mm. Other um, charities mm. kind of approach from different angles, have a more general view, but, but the threat thing works well, isn't it? Because it does focus people's minds, but it's helping them to do that in a very short space of time when they've only got a few weeks in which to respond to 1, something. 1,275 people responded to a digital survey online because we galvanised them about the heritage yeah. that would be lost. Mm. And I was going to say, the planning process should be, it's a mechanism, you know, it's, it's a tool. So actually, the engagement needs to be, what are you actually trying to do? How are you trying to make the world better? How are you trying to save ancient woodland? How are you, yeah. you know, trying to deal with the bump in the field? You yeah, know, so that, so that it does enrich yeah. the lives of people who visit. And then the planning process, yes, we, yeah. can, we can put guidance in place. I would also say that it's recognising that many planners will not understand this. <laughs> um, speaking as a planner, we're jack of all trades, master of none. And it's getting the planners on your side as well, getting them engaged. I think people tend to assume that the planner understands this myriad of issues facing them. But that with, with your race scheme, they've got drainage, they've got archaeology, they've got eco e ecology, they've got people, they've got property, they've got farmers saying this, they've got other people saying that, and they've got so much to take on board. It's making, it's selling the case to the planners as well and getting them on board as well as getting people on board. Um, also, another another big thing that we, we're pushing is children and schools, and we're talking about forest schools, we're getting so many children planting trees through schools and surely presumably you're doing the same thing through the history side of things <coughs> with the curriculum there must be more scope there of getting people engaged young okay well, quickly on another
for world. So Possibly. I, mean, I always think that for, I think, I think like most sort of fairly specialist fields, you'd think everyone would be far, fairly cohesive in what they thought, but um, there's any number of, sort of different sort of, not factions, that's a bit harsh, but you know, um, various societies, people are interested in medieval stuff, prehistoric stuff, and blah, 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 and, 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 and giving a role really to local archaeological societies and local interest groups, I think, who are rather sort of sitting there at the moment, slightly moribund, not quite sure what to do with themselves. So I think uh, something is, I mean, it's, yeah, people don't like all, even though people like them, like people like trains, you know. Some people like steam trains, some people like diesels. <laughs> but it's, <laughs> they all like trains. It's just trying to bring that all, to, all, all together, really. Yeah. And Tara and yourself, that as an approach, does sound interesting? I, yeah, I, I think what you've said is hugely important and incredibly difficult <laughs> <laughs> because you're talking about effectively orchestrating something that needs to be really, really local. Um, I really like the parish councillor approach, actually. We might lobby every parish councillor or something, you know, in order to get local initiatives, in order to help local societies and special interest groups and advocacy groups actually reinvigorate and maybe change their age and engagement profile, because a lot of them are, are struggling to bring in new members, and they really shouldn't be. Um, I think about the Young Archaeologists Club that I was just talking to somebody about, and, you know, getting them young. Um, but doing it in a way that actually there's meaning and it's the same, you know, I can see a star archivist in the room, it's the same as, you know, having a, a really local, meaningful um, thing to focus on, which is actually doing some good. Victoria, very quickly, and one just more question after that. A little yeah. bit of interpretation on site. I, I love it when you can peer through the, the holes, the portals, and see onto, onto sites and seeing what's going on and having that engagement as well. So that it, it's, it's mm. more close to home. Yeah. <laughs> I could talk about spatial planning forever. Um, I, I think spatial planning's awesome um just to say that planning in the uk is devolved and so we're doing it all we're all doing it slightly differently um england is the only country in northern europe that doesn't have a spatial plan for the whole of england which is absolutely appalling we used to have regional spatial strategies um but the tories didn't like them and that it was in their manifesto they were going to get rid of them and um, when we were writing the rss's back in the day it was great because we had all these different parties on board and it was linking things together and making the connections um, archaeology, ecology, it doesn't reflect local plan boundaries. It's, it's irrelevant what local authority is in. It, it, it's about crossing those boundaries. Um, it always makes me really angry that London is the only area that still has its spatial plan. And I think it functions so much better because of that. And it, it, there's a part of me that why, why the rest of the country weren't allowed to do that. And obviously we look like we're going back into a more sort of spatial planning direction, but it's being done on a really ad hoc, random way across the country, um, depending on what, um, what sort of metro mayor powers have. They all have slightly different powers, it's combined authorities, they're all doing it in a slightly different way. So it makes, makes it really, really messy, particularly for people who are working across the whole country. It's really hard to get your head around. Um, so yeah, generally as a profession, if you talk to the Town and Country Planning Association or the RTPI, we are always saying we want more spatial planning. So. And I just have a quick comment. I mean, I, I absolutely agree with what you said. Uh, the problem is that day to day work, you end up dealing with what's immediately in front of you and what you can change in a small way. My big MPPF game was a comma somewhere in the heritage section, I'm not going to tell you where, I've forgotten where it is now, but it was a really, really important comment. I was so happy when it arrived in the right place. So sometimes that's the level of detail that you're, you're dealing with. But I actually take the point, particularly with all the infrastructure investment that's going on at the moment that crosses regional borders as well as district borders, and having a kind of overview of where that's going, I think is, is really important. So it's something that Historic England's keen on. She said there's not much appetite for it at the moment, but I think yeah, the TCPA has been knocking around for more than 100 years, hasn't Ages. it? Ages. These are long-term things uh, that we need to do to fight for. And, and as you say, pointing to examples in Europe, other countries... Even in England, uh, Wales and Scotland, Even they're getting there. locally, mm. then uh, we need to use those to put pressure on government to, to recognise the place of that. It's not the only thing, and if you just focus entirely on spatial plan, you need the other detailed stuff too. 
but I agree at the moment it's a, it's a void I think.